Welcome to part 12 of this week's online lecture. In part 12 we will look at symmetric top molecules. As we've discussed, we've got two different types. We've got the prolate and the oblate. Now it is possible that our symmetric top doesn't have a dipole moment. However, if it does have a permanent dipole moment, it will have a rotational spectrum. So we'll start off with prolate symmetric tops, where the moment of inertia around one of the axes is smaller than the moment of inertia around the other two axes. For phosphorus oxychloride here, the A axis is aligned along the PO bond. The moment of inertia is smallest around this axis. You can't determine that just by looking at it. You have to calculate the moments of inertia. The moments of inertia which are perpendicular to this axis will be the same. The reason why we call it prolate is because if you were to map the rotational constant in space, as we've done here, then it would have this kind of rugby ball shape. I'm going to let you think about that and see whether that makes sense. This is benzene, and this is an oblate molecule. The moment of inertia around the C axis is larger than around the A and B axes. In fact, it is twice the size of the moment of inertia around the B and A axes. Now for this benzene system, of course, you won't see the rotational spectrum because it doesn't have a dipole moment. But the reason it is called oblate is that if you map out its rotational constant in space again, then it would have this kind of flattened M and M shape to it. Let's have a look then at a prolate symmetric top in a little bit more detail. In the following discussion, I'm not going to include centrifugal distortion. Well, what has changed? Well, now, when we solve the Schrodinger equation for the rotational problem for the prolate top, we get the term B times J into J plus 1. This is the familiar term that we get for diatomic and linear polyatomic molecules. But notice we get an additional term here. This new term involves the rotational constant B, but it also includes the rotational constant A. Now the rotational constant B is called B because it is associated with rotation around the B axis. The rotational constant A is labelled A because it is associated with rotation around the A axis, and it won't surprise you that there will be a rotation constant C, which is associated with rotation around the C axis. For prolate tops, of course, the moments of inertia around the B and C axes are the same, and so this equation that describes the energy levels of the system doesn't involve the C rotational constant. So the energy levels do depend on this A parameter, the rotational constant around the A axis. But note that it also depends on this K quantum number. I'll discuss where this K quantum number comes from in a bit more detail a little later. So the additional term depends on the difference between A and B and K squared. So just to remind you, when we were discussing the linear diatomics, we introduced the J and the MJ quantum numbers. You'll remember that the J quantum number is equal to zero or a positive integer. Remember the MJ quantum number is associated with the spatial quantization of the molecules and that was the projection of the angular momentum on the laboratory axis. Note that again, just like for the linear molecules, the energy of the rotational state does not depend on the MJ quantum number. The MJ quantum number does not appear in the energy expression. The K quantum number comes from the projection of the angular momentum on the principal axis of the molecule, in this case along the A axis. Now why does this occur? We can justify that in a manner similar to before. Remember that I said that the quantum numbers come out of the solution of the Schrodinger equation whenever you have to apply a boundary condition. 
Now when we've got two rotational axes, you have to have two coordinates, and so you have two boundary conditions arise from those two coordinates in order to satisfy the single valuedness of the wave function. And so we have two quantum numbers to worry about. This system will also have the j quantum number and the mj quantum number, but we're also going to have a third quantum number k, and that comes about because now we've got three rotational axes. We have three quantum numbers to worry about. We have three boundary conditions which are going to be enforced when solving the Schrodinger equation, and so therefore we get the third quantum number arising naturally. It has to be said that there isn't a unique choice of how we define these quantum numbers. This choice is the one that makes the most sense because it makes the energy equation look the simplest. But in terms of the result, you could solve this with a different definition of the three quantum numbers and a different energy expression, and you would calculate energy levels with exactly the same numerical result. This is the set of quantum numbers which gives us the simplest energy expression. The k quantum number is also restrictive. Remember that for the mj quantum number, its values were restricted by the value of j, which identifies the rotational energy level you were in. Similarly, the k quantum number is restricted by the rotational energy level that the molecule is in. So the values of j can be as before, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. If j equals 3, for instance, then the possible values of k would be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 3. And in a more general form, it is going to be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, all the way up to plus or minus j. So you've got 2j plus 1 k quantum numbers associated with any value of j, just like we did for the mj quantum number and these quantum numbers come from the projection of the angular momentum on the a-axis and I'll illustrate that shortly. This is the expression in terms of joules. We can of course convert this to wave numbers simply by dividing the expression by hc tilde where c tilde is the speed of light in centimeters per second. Remember that tilde signifies that I'm using centimetres rather than metres. So the B rotational constant is just as before, but on the moment of inertia I put a little subscript B because it is the moment of inertia around the B axis. The A rotational constant has exactly the same form, but now it is associated with the moment of inertia around the A axis. Let's have a look to see if there is any difference for the oblate symmetric top. Well, not very much. The solution from the Schrodinger equation has changed slightly. For the prolate, this additional term that we see over here was a minus b times k squared. But now for the oblate, it is b minus c times k squared. Notice that the term in brackets is overall positive because the C rotational constant is going to be smaller than the B, just like A is larger than B. Remember that the rotational constants are inversely proportional to their moments of inertia. Again, J can have values of 0, 1, 2, etc. And K can have values from 0 to plus or minus J. And in this case, the k quantum number arises from the projection of the angular momentum onto the c axis. And if we divide the energy expression here, which is in joules, by hc tilde, we will find the rotational term for the oblate symmetric top in terms of wave numbers. So the big difference now is that when we were discussing the diatomic and also the linear polyatomic, our energy term only depended on the j quantum number. This time, not only does it depend on the j quantum number, it also depends on the k quantum number. To give you a feel then for what I was saying in terms of the k quantum number, here are two relatively extreme results in terms of rotation. The molecule is depicted as a cylinder. It has moments of inertia around all three axes. So it is a three-dimensional object which is spinning in space and we can spin it around a variety of different axes. In the top diagram here, 
This is my angular momentum vector j. So my cylinder is rotating around this axis and it is almost parallel with the molecule's principal axis so that when I project this onto the principal axis this distance then is proportional to my k quantum number. My k quantum number is going to be pretty much equal to j. However, if I am rotating my molecule perpendicular to the principal axis then the projection of this angular momentum vector onto my principal axis will be zero and so k will be zero. You can see that k will go from positive j all the way to zero and then if I keep going it will go to minus j. So that is where the values of k come from. So in this case we have three quantum numbers arising for a symmetric top. They are j, k and mj and they arise because we are solving boundary conditions associated with each degree of freedom of the molecule. Let's return to our rotational term for the symmetric top and we will only consider the prolate top. An analogous expression for the oblate exists. Here is our rotational term. If we know our value of B and we know our value of A, we can calculate the rotational energy levels. If we know what the molecule looks like, we can calculate the rotational constants ourselves and therefore predict what the energy levels are for this system. And below, this is what we have done for all the rotational levels which have J is equal to zero or J is equal to one quantum numbers. If j is equal to zero, our only possible value of k is zero. So if you substitute those values into our energy expression, our energy is also equal to zero. However, if j is equal to one, then k could be equal to zero, in which case the energy would be equal to 2b. It could also have values of k is equal to plus or minus one and notice that their energies are degenerate because the energy depends on k squared and not k. Because it depends on k squared it doesn't matter if k is positive or negative. Its effect on energy will be the same. And so therefore when k is not equal to zero we will have doubly degenerate energy levels arising and we know that degeneracy will modify our rotational spectrum slightly in terms of the intensities of our spectral lines. But what do the different signs of K refer to? The signs of the K quantum number arise because the molecule could be rotating clockwise or anticlockwise. Of course, if the rotational axis is perpendicular to the principal axis, as we have drawn here, then both pictures are describing the same rotation, just viewed from a different angle. However, when the rotational axis is not perpendicular to the principal axis, then rotating clockwise and anticlockwise is different. Clockwise and anticlockwise rotation is differentiated by the different signs of the k quantum number. Now for the degeneracy of the rotational levels. When k is equal to zero, I will have 2j plus 1 degenerate levels. That level of degeneracy, the 2j plus 1, is coming from the fact that the mj can go from minus j to plus j. But if k is not equal to zero, then I will have twice as many degenerate levels because for every set of possible mj levels, I've also got this double degeneracy from the fact that the energy level associated with plus k will be the same as those associated with minus k. All levels with k greater than zero have this additional double degeneracy. This doubling of the degeneracy is in addition to the degeneracy that arises from the mj quantum number. So let's try to predict the rotational spectrum for a symmetric top. We'll do it for the prolate top again. There is an analogous expression for the oblate top. So remember, we have an expression for the rotational energy of a symmetric top in terms of two of these quantum numbers, j and k. 
but remember that spectroscopy is about the transition from one energy level to another energy level. So what we want to calculate now is the difference between any two energy levels. The specific selection rule with regard to the j quantum number still applies, that is that delta j is equal to plus or minus 1. But is there a specific selection rule associated with k? And the answer is yes. The specific selection rule associated with k is that delta k is equal to 0. And as you know, there is also a selection rule associated with mj, but of course the energy doesn't depend on mj, so it's not going to affect our spectrum. Because our energy depends on k, the selection rule associated with k could possibly affect our spectrum. But if you apply the selection rule for delta k is equal to zero, that is that you can't change the value of k during a transition, and you determine the difference in energy corresponding to an allowed transition according to these two specific selection rules, that is the f of j plus 1 comma k minus f of j comma k, where we go from the j level to the j plus 1 level, but we keep the k quantum number the same, the result does not depend on k. The terms involving k cancel each other out when we calculate this difference. This means that the spectral lines occur at exactly the same frequencies in terms of the rotational constant that we had for the linear systems. So despite all that effort, it hasn't modified the spectrum of our molecule. The frequency of the spectral lines still occur at 2b into j plus 1 which means that the spectral lines are still, for a rigid system, 2b apart just like they were for the linear systems. So that means essentially that the spectrum is independent of the k quantum number. This seems like a great thing. It simplifies what the spectrum looks like. However, if it had depended on k, we could have gotten information about the moment of inertia around the a-axis. We would have gotten more information about the molecule. Unfortunately, we can't get any information about the a-axis and the moment of inertia about the a-axis. So it basically means that only the moment of inertia around the b-axis can be determined from the rotational spectrum of the symmetric top. So information about the a-rotational constant in a prolate top cannot be determined from the rotational spectrum. And we can justify that semi-classically. Remember that when we have a diatomic molecule, a heteronuclear, so it has a permanent dipole moment, we got a rotational spectrum because the electric field of the photon could couple with the rotating dipole moment. Now if we have a prolate symmetric top, like the one shown here, and we rotate around the b-axis, you can see again that because the dipole moment in this molecule will be aligned along the principal axis, that is the a-axis, rotation around the b-axis results in an oscillating dipole moment that can couple with the electric field of the photon. However, if we rotate around the a-axis, you can see that there will be no oscillating dipole moment associated with it. As you rotate around the a-axis, the dipole moment is still pointing upwards and it remains unchanged. It doesn't oscillate with time no oscillating dipole moment results and so it cannot couple with the electric field of the photon and so it is not surprising that the selection rule tells us that we are not going to get any information about this in the rotational spectrum. So let's compare our linear and symmetric rotor systems ignoring centrifugal distortion. So here is the moment of inertia of the prolate symmetric top. We can modify it for the oblate if we want to. For the linear top, the moment of inertia around the a-axis is zero. For the prolate top, it is not zero, but it is smaller than that around the b and c axes. The energy levels for the linear top has this term b times j into j plus 1. For the symmetric top, it has the same term, b into j into j plus 1, plus an additional term because we were able to rotate around a third axis. 
Now for the quantum numbers that appear in the energy expressions, so we can ignore the mj quantum number. For the linear rotor, we have a j quantum number that has values of 0, 1, 2, etc. And the same is true for the symmetric rotor. But because of the third rotational axis, we've got a third quantum number, k, that goes from 0 to plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, all the way up to plus or minus j. Notice the similarity in the selection rules. For the linear system, it was just delta j is equal to plus or minus 1. But the same was true for the symmetric rotor. Delta j is still equal to plus or minus 1. But now we've got this additional specific selection rule, which is delta k is equal to 0. But as we've just seen, this doesn't affect the spectrum. The separation between levels is just 2b into j plus 1 for both the linear rotor and the symmetric rotor, which means that the distance between each of the spectral lines is equal to 2b. This is the end of part 12 of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part 13.